Hello, I'm Dr. Rupa Faruqi, and I'm going to read from my short story from A Match Made in Heaven by Hope Road. Um, my short story is called Frida's Breakfast. It's about um, a young woman, a teenager, dealing with an unplanned pregnancy. And it's about um, the themes of mental health and how um, issues such as pregnancy and early marriage may affect how we feel about ourselves and our identity. Frida's Breakfast Frida has terrible dreams. She is so full of terrible dreams that she thinks she might burst open with them. Her boyfriend, she can't say fiancé. It feels too final. It's a word which seems to have a noose attached to it. Thinks that her shifting at night, her troubled sleep, her laboured breath, are because of the baby. In fact, they were all because of her dreams, although she usually dreams about the baby, and so in a way he is right. She hates the way that Salim always seems to be right. She hates the way he asserts this with cheerful, easy confidence. And you know I'm right, he'll say, tossing the sentence off over his shoulder, not even bothering to see if it has landed. She hates this almost as much as she hates her dreams. Frida dreams that she has left the baby in a forest and walked away, picking strawberries nonchalantly while wearing a blood-red cape. She dreams that she wakes, starving, and sees a bowl of dried wafers by her bedside, each with the pale purity of communion host. Somehow she knows these wafers were once a baby but she is too hungry to resuscitate her baby from these dried wafers to flesh and blood. Wolf-like, she eats them instead, gorging with savage irreverence. Or she dreams that she is bulimic, as she was before the pregnancy established itself and her vomiting became involuntary in the first trimester. Instead of throwing up her habitual mess of biscuits and chip butties, she is throwing up the baby. She is purged once more, and with the acid burn in her mouth feels the dark delight that this always gave her. Clean inside and out, cured of her insidious pregnancy. When her friends ask after the pregnancy, ask how she's doing, she laughs at their concern and says with teenage insouciance, what's the big deal? It's not as though I'm sick. But she is sick, 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 infected with terrible dreams. Frida gets up later than the other students who, stare, who share her staircase. The term is almost finished and she isn't bothering to attend morning lectures anymore. She handed in her last paper a few days ago and now has nothing to take care of apart from her final wedding preparations and trying to eat enough calories to fatten the baby. She carefully cleans the communal shower before she, is, before she uses it, scrubbing it over a dozen times until she is satisfied and then she washes herself thoroughly and after that she cleans the shower all over again, disregarding an impatient banging on the door. Frida has always been meticulously tidy, and now suspects that she is becoming compulsively so. It gives her a sense of control, something she no longer has over her body. House for housework as therapy, she thinks bitterly. She's already turned into a housewife. Worse, she's turning into a mother. If she had just an ounce of proper teenage rebellion in her, she thinks she'd have started shoplifting instead. Frida wraps a towel round her before padding back to her room in her slippers. She dresses in her college tracksuit bottoms, the only trousers that seem to fit, and a patterned chemise in faded violet that her mother had carelessly torn and thrown out, but which Frida had rescued and repaired. She makes herself breakfast just some buttered toast and a mug of milky decaf. She resents she is no longer allowed scrambled eggs on the toast or proper coffee. Her mother thinks these rules are stupid, but her mother is no one to judge her, because her mother is stupid too, and blundered through her own youthful pregnancy without even knowing what the rules were, or even that there were rules in the first place. Unlike her mother, Frida is doing this by the book, and so she is excluding scrambled eggs and caffeine, and wine, and sushi, and unpasteurised cheeses, 
She is forcing herself to choke down milk and wheat germ and iron supplements. She even eats a weekly can of sardines, like medicine. Munching on the revolting little bones for extra calcium. She is studying baby manuals and catalogues in as much detail as her coursework. She is making an event of her mistake, celebrating it with baby showers and a big garish wedding, so that it looks like she intended it all along, so that people won't pity her for being just a knob knocked up teenager, so she won't pity herself either. She's announcing to everyone that it is her goddamn dream come true. She is trying not to care that probably nobody is buying this. Not even her more naive college friends. Not even her mother. The worst dream she has is when she wakes in her college room to see that Salim and the baby are dead and she has no idea whether or not she did it. She has no idea whether or not it is real. Apart from the dead bodies, her room is recreated in alarmingly precise detail. Her oversized comb with the two bent prongs, her Punjabi jewellery box, with the cracked lid that she has disguised with green silk fabric and small embroidered mirrors, the black ceramic bowl which she has lovingly glued back together, and her moth-eaten, once pink, now grey bunny with the rattling chest, a line of childish stitches holding in the stuffing. It takes her a moment, on waking, to lose the chilling authenticity of the grisly scene, to remind herself the baby is not yet born, so it could only be a dream. She doesn't want to think about when the baby arrives, when the lines between her dreams and reality become less easy to draw. She doesn't want to think about whether she will continue to kill her baby and her lover in her head at night, and what she will feel when she wakes to see them, sleeping soundly, one in a crib and the other by her side. She doesn't want to consider whether her first thought on waking, on crossing the blurry border between dreams and reality, will be relief or disappointment. There are lines that should not be drawn, so they cannot be crossed. Thank you so much. Um, that was me, Dr. Rupa Faruqi, reading from the beginning of Frida's Breakfast, my short story in A Match Made in Heaven by Hope Road Publishing. Thank you so much.